Good morning. I'm a few minutes late. I apologize for that. I was uh, in a conversation with a friend about uh, the old Snagglepuss cartoon, if you remember that. Uh, and Snagglepuss was a uh, pink uh, mountain lion or, you know, whatever. And uh, and this and I just was speculating as to which came first, Snagglepuss or the Pink Panther. So, you know, which one was created off the other. Anyway, <laughs> with that start, spiritually dynamic start for the day let's join together as we spend some time considering the nature of God who is indeed a, a friend of our souls <clears throat> pray with me almighty God you who are the source of our life strength and ministry in your presence alone we find help hope and life send us from this hour as a healing reminder of your love to all whose lives we touch this day. We offer our prayers in the name of Christ. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verses 1 through, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 through 12. So, um, now, the assumption <clears throat> that most people work under is that Hebrews was written by Paul. We do not know that for fact. Um, and so uh, I, I sort of approach it from Paul's perspective, but it doesn't mean that he was actually the author. Okay, so just know that in the, as we begin. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent which is set up not by man but by the Lord. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, hence it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry which is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, The days will come, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, and not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I paid no heed to them, says the Lord. This is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every one his fellow or every one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Well, as we look at this passage, you know, I, I it starts in an awkward spot. So it uh, it probably would be helpful to go back just a little bit before where this starts in terms of what's being talked about. And what the Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is, is speaking of is the nature of the priesthood relative to the nature of Jesus. And, um, you know, the, uh, the, the old sacrificial system and the ultimate sacrifice. So when we get to this point, what uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying is that um, this new covenant that God has made, which he promised back when he made the first one, you know, and for the years thereafter, it's not like it was a new concept that God was going to present a new covenant, a new agreement, a new uh, way to work with the nature of God, which was way superior to the old one, which basically ruled by rules. Uh, rules that people really could not keep on their own. And even if they could keep them outwardly at some level, uh, the inward, you know, was also a problem. And, uh, 
And so God says, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a new covenant eventually. And it'll be a covenant that will be very different than this covenant. The Old Testament <clears throat> covenant, the, uh, the rules and regulations, the law, the requirements, the sacrificial system. And, and so as we get into, uh, into the beginning of chapter 8, what we're comparing here is the, uh, is the old priest uh, situation. The high priest and uh, the priestly order itself which was uh, subject to a complete renovation ultimately when Christ came and lived and died and then was resurrected. So basically what, what is being said here uh, is, is a reminder of the nature of the Old Covenant and relative to the New Covenant. And we live in the New Covenant. And, uh, and, and the reason why is because God spent all of that time, I mean, think about this, from the time of the Exodus until the time of Jesus' resurrection, God spent all that time dealing with people's souls, preparing the way, the mindset, the, uh, um, the ability to understand the nature of God to the extent that we would recognize him in Christ and in the love and in the concern for our souls that very obviously was presented in the person and in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, you know, as you, as you look at this, it's like this is how diligently, this is the plan that God put in place to reach our souls to engage us in his love because indeed he does love us more than we can even imagine to the extent that it's you know he says i will be merciful toward their iniquities and i will remember their sins no more now that's that's not in the in the immediate sense of the covenant that we're in right now um it, it, at least in terms of uh you know, our need to, it's not like we can go out and run around and do anything we want to, and God's going to forgive us because after all, he just loves us so much and he just can't, you know, stand to spank us or, or tell us we're wrong or any of those things. That's baloney. Anybody who tries to preach that to you, get away from them. Because the truth is that we are accountable. Uh, the difference is that because God has made the sacrifice there is always forgiveness available to us in this new covenant. It, it calls on us to repent. And that means more than just saying, oh, gee, I'm sorry, God, I, I screwed that up. You know, um, Repentance is actually involves taking extra steps to turn away from that which you have done and, uh, and going in the other direction. And that's not buying your salvation, by the way. Um, that is really paying attention to God. Now, sin is this way, and God is this way. Okay, so you kind of got like this, um, and 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 there's that there is that linear um, reality of sin uh, between uh, God's people and God. That you know, it's like God says, and I will take your sins and I will cast them as far away from me as the east is from the west. And if you keep going in that direction, you're never going to come back. You know, it's gone. And so as, when he says, I will remember their sins no more, he's serious about that. It's gone. It does not exist in the mind of God. But in order to get to that point, we need the uh, the cleansing of God's forgiveness. And, and so we mess up. And, uh, and we turn to God in repentance. Uh, we turn to God away from the sin and and we find renewal we find peace we find you know god's salvation we find a, a renewal of our relationship with that one who is the greatest friend of our soul who has known our soul from before it was even created within us god knew who we would be he knew what we would do he knew all of those things and he prepared for it in uh, in Jesus Christ and in, in, in the ultimate sacrifice so we don't need high priests anymore 
Um, you know, he left. Well, Jamie, guess what? You're out of a job. Well, would that it be so? You know, I had a, a pastoral friend in uh, in college who was a who was a chaplain of of the uh, Wesley Foundation, uh, Nelson Ruppert, and Nelson was a, a tremendous guy. Love him. Love uh, Nelson and Joan, his wife. Um, oh my goodness, what they did for us! It was just absolutely amazing. And and, and you know you. You want to talk about feeling loved, you know, feeling the love of Christ through another person. Uh, <clears throat> that was them. And anybody who was part of Wesley Foundation in that time frame knows exactly what I'm talking about. They were and are uh, wonderful people. Anyway, so, um, you know, the uh, one time he said to me, he said, Jamie, uh, and this was after I had uh, received a call from God to pastoral ministry. And uh, we were talking about it, and he said, uh, <clears throat> "He said the job of a of a minister, of clergy, is to work themselves out of a job." And uh, and and I re I remember thinking, I thought I understood that. Uh, as time has gone by, I've understood it more and more clearly, and and it takes us to that point in this passage, which you know. Uh, when he says, and they shall not teach everyone his fellow or everyone his brother, saying, know the Lord. You know, in other words, just wandering around and trying to, you know, introduce people to the Lord. But there is coming a day, and it is not now, okay? But there is coming a day when we will all know that one who is the lover of our souls. And we won't have to try to convince anybody not, you know, think about think about that. It's sort of like um, the very best family reunion or family celebration, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, you know, that you ever experienced uh, increased to an exponential level where you are all one. You know, you are unified. You are together. You are uh, a family. I remember growing up, um, we always had big Christmas things uh, in our family, and we'd have lots of family members and, and other people who would come as well. And so Christmas morning, you know, we'd get up and we'd open up the presents and we'd, they'd be spread everywhere. And then we'd have to clean up because people were coming or because we were leaving to go to somebody else's house. And one year uh, we had the mumps. And uh, my dad had just finished up, and I think it was me and it may not have been, but I think it was me that came down the day after Christmas. But Christmas Day, I felt good. Well, we all felt fine on Christmas Day. <laughs> so, you know, sickness, bing, Christmas Day, sickness, you know. And uh, so, uh, but that day, obviously, nobody wanted to come to our house. And nobody wanted us coming to their house. And, and we had this, we had this personal family time that was unique in in those days of growing up. Uh, as a uh, as just a tight family Christmas and uh, and and we missed you know we missed the furor we missed uh, the the joy of having our cousins uh, uh, I have a cousin his name is Joel he is probably one of the funniest natural people I've ever met in my life um, <laughs> it just is sitting at the kids table was a an experience you, you needed sinus uh, um, help afterwards because there you know there was a fairly good flow of milk if you know what i mean <laughs> and uh but anyway um so we missed that and we really did but by the same token there was a there was just this quiet peace and comfort in being together that day and everybody was healthy you know um you didn't see my dad sick very much and and that was a little scary uh, i remember that anyway so, you know, if, you, if you've ever had an experience like that where you really connected and you really were together and unified totally and it was just this wonderful thing, imagine that for the rest of eternity multiplied by a thousand, you know. And, and that's really what the writer of Hebrews is trying to convey here. We're talking, we're talking about a, a relationship with God who loves our souls so much that he not only forgives our iniquities, but he removes them from himself so they do not exist. 
And if, in fact, they do not exist in the mind of God, they do not exist, period. Okay? In that day. But the mediator of all that was Jesus, of course. The sacrifice and all those all the things that were necessary. There was a price to be paid, and Jesus paid it. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we, we look at the, at the Christian uh, connection, at the Christian story, and we think it's too good to be true. I've had people say that. It's too good to be true. I can't, I can't buy that. Surely I have to do something, you know, for my own salvation. And there's lots of great things you can do in salvation, but uh, as a payment, no, it doesn't work that way. Jesus paid the price fully. So we don't need the high priest anymore to do the sacrifices for us. We don't need uh, any of those things. Um, we, we, and at this point in that transition from, uh, you know, you start out, and, and I'm trying to get some of it on camera here. You start out here in creation. It's right at the top. It, it, it's the best it could possibly be. And everything is wonderful and great. And then you have sin, and you drop to here. And it's as low as it can possibly be. And then God interjects into human history his presence. And he brings you to about here. And that's the law. And, uh, and the law is the law. It has no flex. It has no give. It is just absolute. And we cannot live up to it. And it took how many generations to prove that to the Israelites? And to the world. And then Christ comes and we come to here. We're still living in the world, but we are not of the world. There's been a shift of loyalty, a shift of connection, a shift of, of our responsibility and God's responsibility for us. And we look ahead to the day when we're, you know, back. Um, back as it was in creation. As we were created to be so that God's purposes for humanity would be ultimately and perfectly fulfilled, because otherwise God has failed. God doesn't fail, folks. That's not how it works, <laughs> you know? God is the creator. And, and so the process we have moved through in history and in our lives relative to the, the, the one who loves our souls so much that he will not, break them and force us to be something other than what we choose. Have you chosen Christ? You know, we have we have that choice. And uh, and so, you know, we look ahead to a time when all will be perfect. And that's what he's talking about by the end of this passage. The reality is that the presence of Christ in the world as a saving, redeeming force, presence um, in his people, the body of Christ, the church, it is such that uh, the old covenant is treated as obsolete. That's what it says in, in verse 13, the last verse of this passage, which I didn't read before. I'm going to read it to you now. In speaking of a new covenant, he treats the first as obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And, you know, I think that as we as we look around us, you know, so many people are talking about, oh, this has got to be the end time. Jesus is coming back right away. Personally, I believe that's true. However, I'm not going to preach that as such. Because the fact of the matter is that it it, it is in some ways completely irrelevant when Jesus returns and uh, and the rapture comes and uh, and the world is is ultimately changed that's irrelevant what's relevant is where are you you know where is your soul at with he who loves your soul this much to prepare a plan that encompasses the whole world and uh, in spite of our sin. You know, that's, man, that's love. But it's a love that will not force us because otherwise it would not be love. So we have that choice. And, uh, 
you know, and, and, and in a sense, we can be trapped by sin. We can be trapped by the law where righteousness becomes self-righteousness. Or we can give it to Jesus and we can allow God's righteousness to be rained down on us and into us because that is the thing that will witness ultimately to the love. Jesus, love, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. I said it yesterday, and I may say it again tomorrow. You know, great old hymn. Um, I think they could have done a little better job with the music <laughs> because it sounds so, it, it just, it's it's slow and, and uh, it, it doesn't sound very happy. But uh, it, it is, it is to be happy. It is to be filled with joy. It is the answer. It is the hope. And uh, so with that in mind, through the day, remember that uh, the Lord is the lover of our souls. Loves our souls more than we love our souls. And, uh, and that is the, the power of truth which will see us through. Well, uh, just a couple of announcements for members of the Uigo Church. Um, we will not be meeting in church again this Sunday. Uh, as the week has progressed, I've heard more and more uh, about the, uh, uh, the some of the realities of the COVID jump that has occurred even in, in Uigo. And uh, I, I would be as cautious as I can be. Um, and uh, so we will uh, we will certainly have the Facebook live uh, and then uh, it will go to YouTube as it has been doing. Uh, I will be sending out um, information for the service. We will have uh, a couple of hymns and uh, you'll be able to sing again. So that's the good news. Um, so keep those things in mind as we move ahead. Uh, no in church worship Sunday. Okay. I would invite you now to uh, join with me in prayer. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and in his grace gave us unfailing courage and a firm hope, encourage you and strengthen you to always do and say what is good. Amen. Have a great day. God loves you. God loves your soul more than you love your soul. And... Uh, he is at work. Bye-bye.